Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So this evening, I'd like to talk about mindfulness or loving awareness as both a gateway and the destination. And to talk about the dimensions of it um, in a way that I hope is helpful for you um, who practice and in your practice. And speaking of gateway, um, it's important to say uh, that these teachings and Spirit Rock and the community um, welcomes you all. Whatever particular body you were born into, whatever your class or sexual orientation or whatever your gender identity or whatever your race, whatever your political point of view, whatever background you have, the gates of the Dharma are open and inviting to say, here are practices and understandings, um, may they serve you. So as you listen to this um, tonight, to the teaching, um, you can do it as a kind of meditation in itself, as a reflection. Um, It's meant to empower, to encourage, um, to remind you of what's possible in your own heart and mind and what really matters in some way. And in saying that mindfulness is both the gateway and the destination, um, there's so much teaching of mindfulness out there in the broader world now in education and business and healthcare and for purposes of reducing stress or becoming more productive or all kinds of other things which have great value Um, but there's also something that it leads to that is deeper than those. Um, T.S. Eliot's famous lines in the Four Quartets, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all your exploring will be to arrive where you started, where we started, and know the place for the first time. And so the invitation... um, of mindfulness and loving awareness is really to be alive and present here on this earth, in this life, in a wakeful and um, honorable and um, beautiful way that is given to us as human beings. And this is your gateway to freedom. It's a birthright of all human beings, this capacity to be aware. Um, Now, mindfulness has two aspects to it, Um, like breathing in and breathing out. There's a quality of mindful presence, of becoming really present to life itself. And then there is mindful response. So you breathe in, mindful presence, sit quietly, And then you respond to the world, mindful response. And tonight I'm going to focus more on mindful presence, later on mindful response and relationship to the community around us and to the collective that we're woven into. And there are three dimensions of the freedom that this gateway of mindfulness offers or loving awareness, Um, not to gain but to find just where you are, whatever, wherever your life is, whatever your family, community, work situation, living situation. Um, I have these verses from the Terigata, which are the freedom songs of the earliest Buddhist nuns. It's a new, beautiful translation. So here's one from a, a, a woman named Damadina. She says, For so long I thought only of the river's end. Then one morning I set my paddle down to watch the sunrise over the eastern hills, only to find myself floating somehow gently upstream 
I promise, it's not what I expected. We're so busy paddling, you know, and finally she set her paddle down. And what she was looking for wasn't at the end of something, it turns out, but where she was, where you are, here and now. So the first dimension of freedom isn't about gaining something. And in fact, the the goal of meditation isn't to gain something, but rather to come into a different relationship with this life that we've been given. Um, The first dimension of mindfulness or loving awareness that offers you a, a deeper freedom is the capacity to be mindful of experience, of the content of your experience. And it's very practical um, because as you meditate and as you undertake the training of mindfulness, you gradually learn to trust in your capacity to be present and to tolerate your human incarnation. And that's not an easy thing, baby. You know, I mean, take a look at it. There's a lot of things that are hard to tolerate, you know. Here's a, here's a poem from my dear friend Jane Hirschfield called Fado. With a sleight of hand, a man reaches close and lifts a quarter from inside a girl's ear, and from her hands he takes a dove she didn't know was there. Which amazes more, you wonder, the water's serrated, the quarter's serrated murmur against the thumb, the dove's seduced silence, that they magically appeared, or that in Portugal, this same half-stop moment, it's almost dawn, and a woman in a wheelchair is singing a fado that puts every life in the room on one pan of a scale and itself on the other, and the copper bowls balance. So and if, you, if you've heard Fado, the, the kind of depth of it that comes in that song, in that sound, it's as if it's all of humanity being given through, through one voice. So here we are, we have this human incarnation that we have to figure out what to do with. And mindfulness allows you to do what neuroscientists call expanding your window of tolerance, right? So you sit in meditation, I'm going to get calm and reduce my stress and be happy, right? And what happens? You get a little bit quiet, and some of you just not often go to sleep. I notice that. You need some rest. I'm aware of that, okay? But then when you're not sleeping, what comes up? Anxiety. Your personal anxiety, the collective anxiety, the political anxiety, the environmental anxiety, you know all of those anxieties, right? Um, The unfinished business of your heart, the grief that you haven't let yourself weep, the rage that may be there for the injustices of the world or what's uh, touched you with injustice, the unexpressed love and creativity, or maybe it's just your boredom, you know, or disappointment or restlessness or loneliness. And as the great poet Hafez says, don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deeply. Let it season you as few divine ingredients can. You know, so the point when you sit, if you get bored or restless or the tears come and you grieve or anger comes or longing and so forth, isn't to get rid of it. It's actually to begin to tolerate with loving awareness and say, this is part of being a human being. Because otherwise, guess what? The minute you get bored or lonely, what do you do? Open the refrigerator or go online or whatever your favorite you know, way to put yourself to sleep is because you can't tolerate being with yourself. And so the first great gift of freedom is to allow yourself to learn how to sit with loving awareness for your full humanity. And that means that you'll sit, you know, in times your body will hurt and you have to hold that pain with kindness the way you would hold a crying child. Not the pain that you could move from and people say, well, why should I sit with pain? Because someday you're going to have pain that you can't move away from 
Or you'll be sitting with someone who's in the hospital and holding their hand and they're going to be in pain. And if you don't know how to be with it, you're going to freak out. But if you learn how to be with joy and sorrow and praise and blame and pleasure and pain, this brings an immense freedom to you. And then you have to be with all your desires. I want this and I, you know, and I don't want that. You know your desires, the desiring mind. Julia Child writes, she says, in department stores, so much unnecessary kitchen equipment is bought indiscriminately by people who just came in for men's underwear, right? (laughs) And the desiring mind can pick you up and take you to the mall or Las Vegas. It can get you married. It can also get you divorced. I mean, it can do anything. But to be able to sit and say, ah, this is desire. This is longing. This is boredom, loneliness. This is fear. This is love. You begin to discover that the heart is big enough to hold it all and that you can trust this. And this is an enormous freedom to have. Now, this simple, skillful means that we teach on retreats and classes are to be able to bow to what arises inwardly, to name it gently. This is sadness. Um, This is longing. This is joy. This is love. This is fear. This is hate. To acknowledge it and to get curious. What does this energy actually feel like if I let myself experience it? And then, here's another little move, to invite it to open and say, all right, show me, you know, whether it's longing or love or boredom or fear, show me the whole, you know, the whole nine yards, the whole magilla, whatever language you want to use. Let me display yourself. Let me see it. Because most of the trouble with what you experience in meditation when you get in trouble is your resistance to the experience. It gets worse and worse and worse. And then it stays more, but you say, all right, Let me just experience this. Oh, I'm so restless. I feel like I could die. All right? I'll be the first person at Spirit Rock to die of restlessness this spring. (laughs) Take me. Kill me. Restless, restless. Name it restless. Dying, 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 dying. (laughs) And then you'll notice a little thought comes. I wonder if I should go out for a little snack after, uh, (laughs) after the class. Because the mind has no pride, right? And you begin to realize that you can... Be aware, as we did in that first meditation that we did of being the, the sky of mind, that you can allow experience that the heart is big enough and the mind is space enough to do this. So you name it, you acknowledge it, you let it open, you feel it as an energy. And then something very interesting happens because even though you become spacious, it also brings a kind of intimacy with life. Thomas Merton, the Christian mystic, says... Of what avail is it if we can go to the moon, if we can't cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? So there's something tremendously intimate about loving awareness. It's a willingness to be present for all of the feelings and thoughts and experiences that make up our humanity and to be able to be with them. Now, I'm talking about this in this sort of nice, glib way. You can do this. It's not that easy. And in my own practice, when I sit, generally I can become very spacious, a kind of vastness, but I also live a very complicated and speedy life, and I tend to be a speedy person by nature and somewhat impatient. So, yeah, the there's vastness and metta, but sometimes I'll bring in loving kindness. I'm just impatient, or I'm frustrated, or sometimes it gets harder than that. And I think about, for example, when I went through a very painful divorce seven years ago or so, um, which I didn't want to go through, as one does. And I, I'm um, generally a quite loyal person, and I thought I would be married for the rest of my life, but it didn't happen that way. Um, and there was a lot of grief and agony and anguish. It was really painful. Um, and I would hold it with compassion And um, I remembered when I was training in the forest monasteries and I got sick with malaria and I was lying there kind of out of my mind and sweating and fevery and my teacher came to visit. He later brought some medicines. He said, sick, huh? I said, yeah. He said, makes you want to go home to your mother, doesn't it? Yeah. He said, okay, we've all been there. You can do this. You know, I'll give you some medicine, which will help, but you can do it. And because he had done it, he kind of 
exemplified the capacity that we have. So there I am when it's really hard. And sometimes I couldn't do it. Sometimes it was too painful. It was too sad. And I'd get up. But then I made this practice, which I have now, that I won't get up for three times if something's really difficult. Okay, I have to get up. It's too hard. I'm too caught in it. Okay, that's one time. Now let me sit a little bit longer. Compassion, vastness. Yeah, but this is, this is too painful. Okay, that's twice. <sighs> Breathe. And an interesting thing happens. By the third, on the third time, I let myself get up. So it's not like you're supposed to torture yourself. But an interesting thing happens because as you push the envelope of your capacity to be present for, tolerate all of your humanity, um, your presence deepens and the loving awareness gets stronger. And even in two minutes of saying, I can't do this, but I'll do it a couple more minutes until the next wave I've got to get up comes. In those two minutes, you feel stronger and deeper. Oh, I did that. Yeah, but now you've got to get up. Well, let's try that again. And so what you discover that it's a process, a really trustworthy process, of letting yourself find a way to open to your full humanity. And each dimension of it gives you a kind of freedom. So here, from a woman I work with on a retreat, um, and she was facing the demon, her own inner struggle with binge eating, Um, she said, I believe that food had an unparalleled capacity to bring satisfaction and free me from suffering. Time and again, I've reached for the food, looking for it to do its magic, only to have it turn on me, fail me, bring me untold physical and emotional suffering and shame. I became hypercritical of myself, my situation. I despaired. Freedom has come as I've become more mindful of this, of my own body and the intense discomfort I was trying to escape from. I started to find that I could recover more quickly and less painfully from bouts of compulsive binging if I could stay even a little bit kind to my body and present with my pain. Instead of eating more just to try and avoid the effects of having eaten too much and the remorse of having done it again, I could actually watch myself start down that sad old path. And as the loving awareness grew, I realized, oh, I don't have to do this. And self-compassion would come in. I'm deeply grateful for the compassion that has rescued me from the realm of the hungry ghosts. So it's, it's poignant and it's painful. And it also has a tremendous courage in it of what's possible. So there comes a kind of fearlessness as you practice. And this is a really important thing to say. Fearlessness doesn't mean that you won't be afraid. I remember going with my teacher, Ajahn Chah. We were invited to a monastery on the Cambodian border, a new little forest temple. We got a ride in this um, guy's pickup truck who offered it. He was a young guy who was driving really fast on a a one-and-a-half-lane dirt road through the mountains. And mostly it was fine, but once in a while there'd be a big bus or a logging truck or a water buffalo in the middle of the road, and you couldn't see it around the curve. And he's speeding, and we asked him to slow down, but he was young, and he didn't and wouldn't. And I started to hold on really tight, like, okay, I'm going to die as a monk. All right, what will my mother think, right? And then I looked over and I saw that Ajahn Chah, my teacher's knuckles, were white too. And that somehow reassured me a little bit. (laughs) And finally we made it. We got there. We didn't die. And we pulled into the kind of compound of this place. And Ajahn Chah smiled. He wasn't afraid of dying. He knew that. He showed that many ways. And he looked at me and he said, scary ride, wasn't it? (laughs) And it's just what it was, you know. It's not like... You pretend that there isn't something, that there's fear. But even fear is just, oh, this is what fear is like. Fear is like this. And so as this capacity for loving awareness grows and our trust in the ability to be present for life, um, it not only affects us, but it affects those around us. You know how when you are with somebody who's 
who's able to be present in a difficult situation or in a conflict and so forth, how helpful that is. And if you want to change the world that really needs it, the human world, um, you know that that has to start, that the, that the world needs a change of art. It needs a change of mind. Maybe W. Um, Auden's the poet, um, I keep forgetting his first initials, W.H. Auden, is that right? Um, wrote about loving your crooked neighbor with your own crooked heart. Okay, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's got to start somewhere, and it starts in here, right? So from James Baldwin, um, who writes, um, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their... Um, hate and fear so stubbornly is they sense that once hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with their own pain. A really powerful thing. I imagine one of the reasons that people cling to their hate and fear so stubbornly, you know, is they sense that once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with their own pain. And when we can't bear insecurity, anybody in this room have perfect security? Please raise your hand. Financial security, total, raise your hand. You don't know, you know, physical security. It's just not what incarnation offers. And when you can't, when you can't deal with it, um, then you project it out because it's scary and you can't hold it. And so then it, you blame it, your insecurity. Oh, you blame it on the Muslims or the gays or the immigrants you know, or the Mexicans or black people or yellow people or brown people or you know, um, communists, they were the old one. Remember them? They're coming back around, actually, you know. It's like <laughs> the enemy du jour. But it's, it's actually because, as a society, um, we, um, we, can't, um, uh, uh, we can't tolerate our vulnerability. And yet, as the poet Rilke says, ultimately, it's upon your vulnerability that you depend because we're vulnerable to each other. Every time you drive down the street, you're vulnerable to the people stopping at red lights so you can go through the green, you know? Or for the farmers and the woman with the bandana who picks the strawberries and the people who spray the pesticide on your food that, it, that gets washed off. I mean, we're in it together. And every breath you take dusts the top of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa as it comes over the Pacific, but it also dusts the Fukushima nuclear reactor. It's us. And so when we can hold this with compassion, then we become a different force in the world that doesn't project it on others, but understands that this is our human lot and we can do this in a beautiful and wise way. You know, there's a lot of publicity recently about the National Memorial for Peace and Justice that just opened in Montgomery, Alabama that was in part started by Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Initiative. And hopefully many of you have at least seen the photos because it's extremely moving, you know. And there are those long um, wooden poles that are there under the roof for each county in America where terrorism was committed against black people, you know, with the names of the people who were lynched women, children, men, young, you know, teenagers. Um, and it's a little bit like the truth and reconciliation um, process in South Africa. It says we need to be able to see this and tolerate the shame and the pain and the suffering of it if we're to live in a different way. And your practice of mindfulness is um, that which allows you to live with your true humanity and be in, in the presence of the unbearable beauty of life and the ocean of tears. So it's really, uh, um, it's the gateway to your freedom, and not just your own, but to our collective freedom. Now the second dimension of mindfulness or loving awareness, beside being able to be aware of, to hold with compassion, to tolerate, the range of human experience, because as Auden points out, it's not just the crooked neighbor, but it's our own. You know, there isn't anybody who doesn't have, because we live in cultures of it, who doesn't have their own prejudice. I do. You know, our own racism, our own 
our own fears, our own hatred that we tolerate, and then we can actually examine it and instead of being lost in it. So you start to realize, okay, the point isn't so much to perfect yourself. Okay, I'm going to be this perfect person. It's to perfect your love, to perfect your compassion for humanity itself, yourself included. Then the second dimension of freedom that comes through mindfulness and loving awareness is not mindfulness of the content of experience, but then you start to notice the process of experience. And again, this is tremendously practical because in the midst of drama, now I know you don't have drama, but some people do, right? In the midst of loss, of being triggered, in the midst of fear or difficulty, or even of new possibilities, there's another way of relating than being closed down or reactive. I remember the Ojibwe Native American saying, sometimes I go about pitying myself when all the while I'm being carried by great winds across the sky. There is another perspective. And loving awareness not only sees the content of experience and can hold it with compassion, but also it illuminates the nature of life. And as you pay attention, you notice wherever you pay attention is in change. Everything is changing. It's impermanent, you know. It's, the, the Pali word is dukkha. <clears throat> it has some problems built into it, which I'll explain. It has suffering and loss and so forth, whatever you look. <clears throat> and it's also empty. And these things need a little unpacking, so I'll try to do that. In the Buddhist uh, stories, the Buddha was wandering with various followers and he came to the bank of the Ganges River and he said, see the bubbles that float along the bank of the Ganges River? And they said, yes, we do. He said, examine them. And if you examine them closely, you'll see that they appear, but that they're fundamentally empty, that there's no substance to them and that after a time they disappear. They said, we see that. He said, in the same way, examine your thoughts and your opinions. Examine your emotions. Examine the sensations in your body, the views and, and perspectives you have about life. And they too, as we practiced in the first meditation, arise for a time and then vanish. And the more quiet you get, the more you start to see... Um, that kind of emptiness, if you will, that things don't last and they're insubstantial. Let me put it in some other languages. 1960s, it was a good time here in San Francisco. I was here for that. Hey, baby, summer of love, all right. It's gone. You may have. So are the 90s. In fact, remember Y2K? That one's gone too. Remember 2017? Where are they? They're back with the pharaohs, you know, and they're back with um, Genghis Khan, and they're back with Lao Tzu, and they're back with the dinosaurs. They disappeared back to where everything goes to. Where is that? Things appear in the reality of the present, and then they vanish like bubbles. Where is the year 2000? Where is last week? Where is your childhood? <sighs> Gone, right? And we feel things to be solid, but when you get quiet, they really are not. And they don't last. And therefore, you can't hold on to them. I mean, you can try holding on, but then what you get is rope burn, right? <laughs> so things are impermanent. This is part of what you start to see. And your wisdom grows. Oh, yeah, it's all in change. That's the reality of it. And then you can't hold on to it, really. And then you see dukkha. And dukkha is a word, a complex word that means unreliable, pain, loss, aging, sickness, death. Um, again, that life has both the unbearable beauty of the world and the ocean of tears. And this is what human incarnation is made of. And that even the most beautiful experiences which we have as human beings don't last. And not only that, you're in the middle of that beautiful experience, the best wine and the most beautiful music and the 
whatever it is, greatest love making. And then that little thought comes in, gosh, I hope we can do this again, you know, or <laughs> because you know it's gonna end. And so built into incarnation is the fact that everything dissolves. And what does it mean to be alive and wise and loving in a world that this is true? This is the way that it is. And loving awareness or mindfulness allows us to see this and to see that we're all in it together. Because what comes with this then is a sense of our common humanity. There you are aging. You may have noticed that, right? Or you're going through financial loss or divorce as I described or, you know, or someone you love has died or even worse. I mean, people come and talk to me um, and one of their children has died, which is kind of the most unbearable of pains, you know. And there's a, there's a poem in these um, beautiful songs that I started to read from the nuns of a woman whose daughter Jiva died. And when she was meditating, all of a sudden she was weeping and she began to realize how many other mothers had daughters named Jiva and that a certain number of them too had died. And then all of a sudden she realized it wasn't just those mothers, but that they are in India. She was in, in the middle kingdom of India at that time. Or in the, you know, she realized, oh, I am part of all mothers. And sometimes we give birth and they live, and sometimes we give birth and they die. And she realized it wasn't personal to her, even though it was tragic and personal, but that there was something greater that she was a part of. And that's true in financial loss or divorce or whatever we want to talk about. There comes a different kind of tears, not just the tears because there's a grief that we have to grieve for some change or loss that's very important. But they're called the tears of the way. They're the Dharma tears that say, oh yeah, this is what it's like to be a human being on this on this earth, to have birth and beauty and creation and celebration and also to have loss and death and illness. And this is what's given to us. And as we, as we open to this reality that it's not us and we didn't make a mistake, we're suffering because we did something wrong. That's not what dukkha means. Um, suffering isn't because you were bad or did something wrong. It's because you're a human being and human life has joy and sorrow and praise and blame and gain and loss and birth and death and sweet and sour. It's, it's woven together with these opposites and it can't not be. How could you have um, day without night? You know, how could you have birth without death? And what happens as the sense of common humanity grows when we see that it's all impermanent and, and ungraspable in some way and the heart becomes tender and wise, the tears of the way. And one becomes very forgiving. This is William Butler Yeats. Where are you, Willie? I'm here. Oh, yeah. He says, I'm content to follow to source every event and action and thought his whole life. Measure the lot. Forgive myself the lot. When such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows in my breast. For we must laugh and we must sing. For we are blessed by everything. And every, everything we look upon is blessed. And there comes a tenderness that says this is our life. And instead of the kind of struggle against the way things are, there instead grows a trust that, like our ancestors and the generations before and the, the Miwoks who walked this beautiful land and left it for us, um, that the generations turn and we're part of something so much bigger. And at the end of things, it's not always the end of the story, you know. Today... 200,000 people died, give or take a few. And today, 250,000 people were born. Tomorrow, 
200,000 more will die and 250,000 more will be born every day. This is wild, you know. This is us coming into being, having an earthly dance, and then leaving these bodies. And what's beautiful in understanding this, it's not tragic, it's actually, you know, equally magnificent, is that when something ends, something else always is born. And you can begin to trust this in the most beautiful way. You know, you think you've come to the end of your road and that all the gates are closed and you have to be quiet for a while and maybe feel your fear and your grief and what will come. And then I promise you, something new will come. It always does. I like to think about um, Ellen Sirleaf and Lehman Gaboi, both who received the Nobel Prize in, I guess it was six or seven years ago. Um, and they were um, the leaders of Liberia in uh, West Africa. And um, Ellen said, you know, because they'd been through so much pain and struggle and warfare in, in their country and around that part of West Africa. Um, and in celebrating her Nobel Prize, she said, Liberia used to be known for its child soldiers, and now they remember our country for its women. You know, and out of that came something that had never happened before there. So there's also a way that with our great hearts, with the loving awareness that grows, that we can trust and rest in, um, we know that whatever happens is not the end of the story, that something new is waiting to be born. That's how it is. And, um, I mean, it's, it's completely, uh, where's this page I was looking for? Mm-hmm. Hundred billion red cells are born in you each day. New red cells. One hundred billion new red cells. I mean, you're amazing. Think of that, right? And 600,000 particles of skin leave your body every hour. That's why you need a vacuum, by the way. <laughs> you know, you get a new stomach lining every five days. Yeah, right. New eyebrows every four months. Those of you who don't pluck them, anyway. You know, and pretty much your liver replaces itself every six weeks. You know, you too are being reborn and remade. This is not the same body you had back then. Well, you know that. You just look in the mirror, you know that, right? (laughs) You are part of something that is renewing itself. And this is part of our common humanity as well. So you begin to find the freedom of tolerating experience, being with the the full range and the content of your humanity. You start to see the principles, the laws the impermanence and the emptiness and the ungraspability, you start to realize what it means to see the whole process of life renewing itself. And there's a great freedom that comes, whatever drama you're in, oh yeah, this is part of the renewal. And you begin to trust that. And then last, how do we hold this immensity? This third dimension of mindfulness is an awareness of consciousness itself. It's what we were doing in that meditation when we started this evening, um, and in a way why I um, started with that practice. And again, it's really practical. This is not talking about some kind of philosophy that you have to believe. You try it for yourself and see whether you can learn to be present. When you, and when you are, what are things doing? What is the nature of your life? So then here's the next step. When my teacher, Ajahn Chah, was living as a forest monk, um, he practiced very ardently in caves and out in the forest with the tigers and elephants and things. He had lots of stories about that in the old days. Um, And because he was an ardent meditator and 
quite devoted. At times he had great experiences. His body would fill with light and he would have visions and great insights and all those things. And for people who come here on retreat, we have an annual two-month retreat. And one of the honors I've had for 20 years of that was to sit with people and uh, each day and talk about what's happening in their practice. And amazing things happen sometimes. Your body does dissolve into light and, you know, rapture and all kinds of beautiful things. So he had these great insights and experiences. And he thought, all right, what do, what do I do? I'm going to go see the the uh, most renowned master of his time, who's another Ajahn or teacher named Ajahn Mun, forest master. And he went to see him and he said, I need to tell you about the last years of my practice and get some guidance. So he laid out all these things after he bowed and sat there quietly for a bit. And then Ajahn Man looked back at him and said, Cha, you missed the point. Those are just experiences. He said, they're like movies. You can go to movies and there's a romantic comedy and there's a documentary and there's a war movie, you know, and there's a... um, a drama and so forth, or a cartoon, animated, whatever it happens to be. He said, those are just movies that appear and disappear. And the point is, they're always changing. You can't get one of those movies to stay. The question is, to whom do they happen? What you have to do now is turn your attention from the movies, which you're able to be present for, back to ask, who is seeing this? Turn it back to consciousness itself, to awareness, um, and become, the word in Pali is Siki Bhutto, um, uh, the one who knows, the witness to all things. Um, to turn your attention back, and my Ajahn Chah again used this phrase, to become the knowing, or the one who knows. Um, and in this very practical way, you step out of the drama of life and you start to witness it, as we did in that first meditation, from the place of loving awareness or consciousness itself that says, hmm, look what's happening now. This is this kind of drama, you know. This is a war movie or a conflict or this is a love story or whatever it happens to be. Um, Another simple way to explain this, I mean, we did that meditation. You can try it at home, look in the mirror. And when you look in the mirror, you'll notice you've aged, right? It droops, it's wrinkly, it loses its fur in some places, and it grows new fur in other places. You know, it's weird, as my colleague here, Wes Nisker, says, the hard parts become soft and the soft parts become hard. And, you know, it ages, okay. But the interesting thing is that when you look, you don't necessarily feel older, right? Everybody know that experience? And that's because... It's only your body that's getting old. And you look in the mirror and try it, and you notice that it's drooping or whatever it's aging doing. But the the consciousness that's seeing it is outside of time. The body exists in time. It's little and gets bigger and adult, and then it goes older and then it dies. But the awareness itself is timeless and says, hmm, Let's see, how are we doing in this incarnation, basically? Oh, it seems to be like we're in the middle at best right now. We're sort of in the, you know, closing stages or whatever. Um, But the consciousness is not limited by your body. I mean, I know it because I've sat with people, um, you know, in coma where the flat line, they say they're not, you know, nothing's there. And then I was sitting with Marlene Jones, who is one of our wonderful teachers here, um, and she'd had a, you know, heart failure, and they didn't get to her in time. It was a long time before they, she got to the hospital, and for a week, no sign of anything. Um, brain dead, body hardly responding, every kind of thing, no response. So her daughter and family and I decided, all right, take her off the life support. And I was holding her hand, and I said, Marlene, you're leaving us too soon. I really loved you. We needed your support and help. You were so great and so forth. But the least you could do is give us a sign or something, you know, thinking maybe afterward, whatever. And I said that, and two tears rolled down her cheeks. Nothing for a week, no response. Who we are is not this physical body. 
This is the reality of it. You know, we identify with our body, we identify with our views and our feelings and our thoughts and so forth, but that's not the game. And as we begin to rest in loving awareness, um, there's a kind of shift of identity that's tremendously liberate, liberating. Here from Thich Nhat Hanh, where he says, this body is not me. I'm not limited by this body. I am life without boundaries. I've never been born and I've never died. Since before time I've been free, birth and death are only doors through which we pass. Sacred thresholds on our journey, birth and death are a game of hide and seek. So laugh with me, hold my hand, let us say goodbye to meet again soon. We will meet today and again tomorrow. We will meet at the source of every moment in all forms of life. And, you know, this is what, first of all, it's true. You can check it out yourself, but it happens to have the charm of being true. Um, it is, um, it's what got, yeah, what got Thich Nhat Hanh through the horrors of the American Vietnam War, through all kinds of terrible things. You know, when he, how could he do this? Because he knew that he wasn't limited by this body and mind. And so he was able to impart that to others around him. I mean, I was just in Dharamsala with the Dalai Lama for these mind life science teachings, and he was talking about his own practice. And he said, you know, if I go somewhere and I think I'm the Dalai Lama, it doesn't go so well, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, we're not the roles. I mean, we get to inhabit them, but that's not who you are. There's a coming home. Um, and all right, here's one more way to talk about this mystery. So we're really talking about about the mystery of incarnation. Derek Amato, um, in his late twenties, um, dove off a diving ball into a diving board into a pool and hit his head on the bottom. It was a shallow end, and had a horrible concussion. Lost part of his hearing, and you know, was rushed to the hospital. All those kind of things. Wasn't fortunately paralyzed. But when he came back, he had this odd impulse and he went to a friend's house who had a piano and he sat down. He'd never been musical, never studied it. And he played this incredible piece of music. He is now called, um, uh, it's called an acquired musical savant syndrome because they don't know what the hell to call it. But basically, <laughs> and at from that moment, even though he'd never studied, and he didn't just play, he could play Beethoven and Bach, but also he was composing, and he was composing rock music, and, but he didn't compose it like write it down. He just played it. The extra, there was a beautiful NPR show, if anybody, or there's YouTubes of him, and he's as astonished. He said, I started to weep. I couldn't, what is this coming through me? But it's like Rumi the poet, you know, or Mozart. Do you think Mozart composed that stuff? He heard it, and he wrote it down as fast as he could before it disappeared, you know? Or Rumi the poet, Mathnau is the ocean of poems. Somebody going around behind him writing it down. He was listening to the music of the spheres, to the poem of the ages, and, you know, a 100,000 verses just poured through him. Who do you think you are? Consciousness is not just that little thing. You are connected with it all, and really... Personality is, I think Aldous Huxley called it, a reducing valve, basically. So you can handle the dimensions of mystery, you know, and still, you know, remember your social security number, basically, <laughs> you know. So you are consciousness itself. You are all that is. Um, this is your true nature. And when you can witness the world from that place, as we practiced in the beginning, the practicality of it is that it reduces fear. Fear arises, but, oh, that's just fear. It reduces the grasping. You realize this is not, you know, the story of the world being your body or what you have and so forth. It's just not the deepest reality. And you live in a different and much freer dimension. And then finally, as your identity shifts... Um, it all comes back in a circle because it's not like levels. These are actually all like a mandala or dimensions. We're complex beings. 
And these are dimensions of consciousness. And in the Zen ox herding pictures, you see at the end of, you know, going and finding the ox and taming it, there's a whole beautiful Zen story. The the tenth picture is this guy returning um, to town um, with what's called bliss bestowing hands. I carry my wine bottle in one hand, you know, not afraid of anything, and I've got my staff in the other, and I go back and I offer blessings to everything that I touch. And there's something that happens when you become able to tolerate experience of all kinds so that your heart grows wise and big and compassionate. When you see the nature of life, impermanent, empty, ungraspable, containing both the tears the tears of the way and the beauty of the world, um, that it's not that you're in the world, the world is in you. That you are this consciousness in the world, you are, this is what you are. You're ha- it's having its way with you. And you fall in love with the world, you know? And you fall in love with the sky and the grasses, you know, and you fall in love with all the weird people sitting around you. In spite of yourself and in spite of world history, you fall in love with it because it's magnificent. You know, and you fall in love with wood and ru- carpets and, and um, bells, you know, and light and dark and say, wow, what an amazing, there comes awe and mystery and, you know, Allen Ginsberg's coda to his great poem, Howl, where he starts, holy, 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 everything is holy. And in the vastness, said Nisargadot, one of my Indian teachers, in the vastness of consciousness then, there's only one movement, the movement of love. Because it's all you. It's your life. But it's not your small life. You are life expressing itself. And you can enter and abide in this. And then, with bliss bestowing hands, you know, you're able to tend the world, to reach out and mend it, to do what's necessary, but from a really different place. You bring a sense of joy or ease, even to the great sufferings and difficulties. And, you know, I've told the story in other nights of being at the airport um, with my daughter for the demonstrations after that first uh, January a year ago um, presidential uh, edict that, um, that forbid people coming to the U.S. from those predominant seven predominantly Muslim countries, and it was big demonstrations. And we went down together. She's a um, asylum lawyer, and she came down with a whole group of young lawyers who were trying to basically get asylum or save people whose lives are in danger from all around the world. Um, there were more young lawyers there than there were people who needed lawyers, in fact. And they, they put out a sign, anyone need you know immigration or legal help or whatever. But anyway, not everybody was, had their signs and they were um, shouting you know, and chanting and the usual kind of archetypal demonstration. The best piece of it, we were at one gate, there were about 400 people. The whole thing had a couple of thousand people in it for a couple of days. And in the middle of this one, everyone's chanting, no ban, no fear, refugees are welcome here. There was a New Orleans jazz band. And so people are chanting, and then the drummer kicks in with a nice riff, so you get kind of a little pulse behind it. And then the trumpet plays a beautiful riff on top, and the trombone comes in, you know, and pretty soon everybody is chanting and singing you know, at the same time in the whole No Band, No Fear turns into this like New Orleans jazz piece. The security guards, the cops, everybody's smiling because it was an important demonstration and a statement, but you could feel the love in it. You could feel the joy in it. It wasn't against something. It was for life itself, you know. And so Molly Ivins, who was a a really wonderful... um, writer, columnist, activists, all kind of other things from Texas and New York Times and all those kind of dangerous places. Um, she, she wrote, um, so keep fighting for freedom and justice, beloveds, but don't forget to have fun doing it. Be outrageous, rejoice in all the oddities freedom can produce 
And when you get through celebrating the sheer joy of a good fight, be sure to tell those who follow how much fun it was. You know? And so when this capacity for mindfulness grows, for loving awareness, and we can rest in it, there come both the tears of the way and the joy of participation in life because it's ours and it's us. Um, And I read a poem a month or two ago, um, but I want to read it as I close. Um, Because when I came back from India, this was about a month ago, I was in Washington, D.C. teaching, and so I got there just in time to go down to um, Pennsylvania Avenue to the big um, March for Our Lives that happened. And it was remarkable to be there. I mean, many of you people were at, were at other marches of this kind, those of you who are of that particular persuasion. And again, I don't assume what your politics are, but for me this felt important personally. And um, I want to protect people. I want to protect people who are black I want to protect people who are brown. I want to protect gays and lesbians and immigrants. I want to protect the dignity of everyone, including even the people who don't want to protect people. And I want to protect people who keep our our laws. And I want to protect the, you know, the, the police and the government and the firefighters and all of it. But all of it out of respect. And the beautiful thing about that march was that um, there was so much civility there. It was not just peaceful, and yeah, there were lots of kids and families and young people and so forth. Um, but it had a spirit of love. It had a spirit of great care, you know, and and a kind of fierceness. This really matters, but it was also really civil and beautiful. So here's a poem from my friend Alison Luderman, a wonderful poet in Oakland. Um, she writes, "I see her on TV." screaming into a microphone, her head is shaved, and she's beautiful, and 17, and her high school was just shot up, and she had to walk by friends lying in their own blood, her teacher bleeding out, and she's my daughter, the one I never had, and she's your daughter, and everyone's daughter, and she's her own woman in the fullness of her young fire, calling bullshit on politicians who take money from the gun makers. Tears rain down her face, but she doesn't stop speaking. She doesn't apologize. She keeps calling them out, all of them, all of us, who didn't do enough to stop this thing. And you can see the gray faces of those who've always held power contort, utterly baffled to face this new breed of young woman, not silky, not compliant, not caring if they call her a ten or a troll. And she cries, but she doesn't stop. Stop speaking truth into the microphone, though her voice is raw and shaking and the sun is molten brass. I'm 3,000 miles away thinking how Neruda said the blood of the children ran through the streets without fuss. Only now she is, they are raising a fuss, shouting down the walls of Jericho. And it's not that we road-weary elders have been given the all clear exactly. But our shoulders do let down a little. We breathe from a deeper place. We say to each other, Well, it looks like the baton may be passing to these next runners. And they are fleet as thought and fiery as stars. And we take another breath and we say to each other, The baton has been passed. And we set off then, running hard behind them. And it's hard not to weep when I read it. Um, I love the ending, too, because it's not just them. We set off running hard behind them. Because it's for all of us, for what we care about, and each of you will have the things that you care about. As you open, as your heart opens, and as you become wiser in these ways that we've described, um, there's nothing else to do but to tend the earth. Because it's you. It's your earth. It's your people, and so forth. And this isn't linear, you know, and there isn't one layer after another, but these are your gifts, your birthright, your capacity to rest in loving awareness and to open in these ways. Um, And it's 
why we come together to remind ourselves. And it's also why our community here has offered this place for us for all these years to come and be reminded. So let's just sit for a couple of minutes. Good night.